Hi, I'm Shannon Nelson. Happy to have with me today, comedian Daryl Lennox. All right, we want our leaders to lie to us, so nobody would have voted for George Bush if he was honest about his flaws. Who wants to hear the flaws before you vote? Nobody would have voted for George Bush if he said, you know what, America, sometimes when I be voting, I be talking. I mean, you know, I don't even, I don't even know what I be saying. My mind just disappears. Daryl Lennox absolutely loves what he's doing these days. And even though he's had some tough knocks in his career, like being homeless and heartbroken, he seems to be flying high now. And he's happy to acknowledge that all the years he spent in Canada have really helped him to be a funnier guy. Who are these new people that get mad at text messaging? I am happy to have you here today, Daryl. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks for having me. So, um, I've read that you say that there's no one you know that loves comedy as much as you do. I stand by that. I've met a lot of people, but I don't, I don't think anybody loves it as much as I do. So, what is it that you love about it? I think it's the perfect thing for me. Um, I think it allows all of the things that I, I think I'm pretty good at. Uh, my passions, my emotions, the spiritual quest that I have. It all fits, fits into that microphone for me. The first time I ever got on stage, I just knew that this was what I was supposed to do. And it's changed my life and my point of view, and I got to see the world, and I've met so many people, and it's, it's just an incredible thing. Well, you mentioned spiritual quest. Mm -hmm. Elaborate on that a bit for me. I, when I was 18 years old, I was sitting in this Baptist church in Las Vegas, and I had this, you know, little voice in my head that said, you know, you're supposed to do something special, so give your life to me. And so I went up there, and I kind of awakened a bunch of, you know, ideas and, and kind of my soul about me thinking I was supposed to do something. And then, like a lot of religions, I got disillusioned. Uh, some of the answers weren't found, you right. know, in the Bible or by the pastor. And then somehow. I've always known that I was supposed to do something. And then when I got on stage the first time, uh, it was it was like this peace, a little serenity thing. And I came off stage and people were, were flipping out. And I had such a corny set, but the last thing I said was, uh, listen, if you only get to go around once, uh, have as much fun as you can. And so people thought I was just like a guru or something, but I, I think it's just because I have a deep voice is more than anything. You have and an so, awesome voice. Oh, thank you. You do. Thank you. You make a good preacher. Oh, I hope not. Ever, <laughs> ever thought about doing that? Uh, yeah, I did actually. But then uh, it's way better to get some laughs, a little alcohol. It's always good. <laughs> it's well, way maybe you can incorporate than, that into and, the sermon. Well, Who knows? I know. But it's it's been good. So now I have this, you know, spiritual quest to, you know, I believe in making dreams come true, so I talk a lot about just life stuff on stage, and, and I, it's weird. I, happen to, I want to be a man Oprah. Summed up this like that, I want to be okay. a man Oprah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you I want to inspire. Like I want to inspire people. And help people fulfill their dreams. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. You're, and you're doing it by example. Yeah, I, I feel like it. Let me ask you this. So you said you were in a Baptist church when you were 18. Do you still go to church? Nope. Uh, okay, how come? I love the people. I love everybody's relationship with their belief system. I am not a big fan of the dogma and the indoctrination. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I can spend all times of time talking to people about religious stuff, but I, I'm not a big fan of, of the, the dogma and indoctrination. And a lot of religions are fear-based, and mm -hmm. I can understand that, but I just can't embrace that. Mm -hmm. Do you so, pray? All the time. I pray, I meditate, I fast. I have a really deep connection. I actually have on my phone, I'm an MP3 player, I have this, uh, every morning I listen, I, I wake up and I meditate and I listen to this, uh, uh, this book on tape called Communion with God. And I listen to it on, before I go on stage, so my, my belief system is the biggest part of who I am. Hmm. Tell me how that factors in your comedy. I mean, are there certain places that you won't go from a moral point of view? Mm -mm. Certain things you won't do? No. I won't ever try to hurt anybody's feelings. I won't try to offend anybody. Um, not that I would know what was offensive to one person or not, but uh, I really believe in this, this concept that, you know, we're all pretty much just a one of us. And, you know, what inspires me, if it hurts you, then I apologize, but still allow us to all have our expression. So I won't get mad at you if you don't like what I say. And I hope you allow me the same, you know, expression. So it's kind of a, a real oneness aspect of things I like to talk about. Mm. Would you call it a calling? 
What you do, the comedy? Feels like it. Yeah. Feels like it. Hmm. Okay, well, let's talk about how you originally got into comedy, because mm -hmm. you were born in Las Vegas, right. raised in Las Vegas, yeah. and you have a, quite an interesting lineage. Okay. Sure <laughs> you I know do. what I'm talking about. Sure I do. Your father, and uh, you have talked about this. Sure. I met my father after my religious disillusionment. I left uh, <laughs> Las Vegas, and I... I <clears throat> I was I have a great stepdad, so I can say this. I have a great stepdad, but I wanted to see what my DNA strands were. I wanted to see the other half. And my mom was so hurt by my dad, and I wanted to see him. And so I got a chance to meet him. He lived in Seattle, Washington. And I remember I was 16, and I talked to him on the phone. And I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a, I'm a PIMP. And he was a pimp. And I, and I went and met him, and that's exactly what he was, and a pimp and a drug dealer. And... and it was way, way, way one of the most powerful and interesting and life dictating things I'd ever been through in my life. Just to see, I saw why my mom was that hurt, mm -hmm. and then uh, I got to see, I got to see the other half of me. I got to see, you know, we talked about a lot of things. Some of it really good, and some of it just horrible. Mm -hmm. And and then I had to leave him. I, I it wasn't the five. I wanted to be like courtship of Eddie's father, you know, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. No, no. Wow. So, and now, and wasn't your grandfather also a my pimp? My grandfather was a pimp. My uncle's a pimp. You're some serious pimp and pedigree. Yeah, yeah. I'm a whole whisperer. <laughs> That's what the joke is. <laughs> Say that again. You're I'm a, a whole whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you went to Seattle, met your father. Did you, you ended up staying there a while, didn't you? Yes, I stayed there. Uh, and, and then I got on stage in October of 1989, and I thought, this is it. And I stayed in Seattle until 1993, right. and then I moved to Los Angeles, and I stayed there for almost a year, and I ended up in Surrey, British Columbia. <laughs> From L.A. to Surrey. That's right, February of 1994. Yeah. Those yeah. first few years when you were doing comedy, were mm -hmm. they tough? <clears throat> it was uh, probably still the most fun I'd ever had in my life. It was probably because uh, it was instant gratification, and it felt like I was making my dream come true. Mm -hmm. I could always see when I was getting better. And and I always knew that I was, I know, you know when you know that you're supposed to be doing something, when you can cry about it, good or bad. Hmm. And uh, and I cried a few times over something that was, I just had a great set and it made me cry. And then I had the most horrible set I'd ever had. And I was dating this girl. And then afterwards, we went back to her house and we were laying in her bed. And she said, can I ask you something? And I go, what? She goes, why do you think any of that was funny? <laughs> and... I got up, you know, and I walked home, and I mean, I cried. I cried like Ben Stiller did in There's Something About Mary. Remember that movie? Yeah. He was so I sobbed so hard. Wow. And then I thought, I must really love this. pick yourself up when you know when you bombed and not that you, you probably don't bomb anymore but there've got to been some bombs in the past and what do you do like how do you kind of corral your your good energy again to get out there I ne I'm never not looking at the big picture ah I'm never not I can always see the prize and everything I always believe that every single thing is making me better the bomb the good set the you know I was offended by that or you shouldn't have said that I always learn something and so I was, when anybody, if anybody ever tells me anything, I act like it's the truth. Mm -hmm. If they go, or you were too vulgar that show, I act like it's the truth. And then it'll, I, I will make everything that ever happens or said to me, I will make me make me better. So you're a listener. Yeah. Hmm. You came to Surrey, mm -hmm. B.C. Yeah. And stayed? Mm-hmm. For 12 years. About that, yeah. So, well, not well, sorry though. Who wants to stay well, sorry no. for 12 years? <laughs> well, sorry, not that bad. <laughs> oh, well, right. But it's got a bad rep. But believe yeah. me, they're a little defensive about that rep I out there. Know. And there's some wonderful parts of Surrey. Um, what was it that made you decide to stay in Canada? Was it the difference in how we are socially? Um, 
compared to what it's like in the States? Because you're a black man. We don't have very many black men here in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that must have been different for you. More than anything, Shannon, I got to reinvent myself. And I started over and people just let me do that. There's yeah. a very non-judgmental air about Canada. They just let me. I could walk. I got up every day and walked through the streets of Surrey, you know, chanting that I'm going to get better and I'm going to make myself great. And people just look at us, a new crazy black guy in the neighborhood. <laughs> and they just let me get better. And, yeah. and then I learned to understand the humanity aspects of things. Mm -hmm. In the States, it's all about emotions and, and, and things. But here is a, there's a practical understanding of humanness that I really enjoyed living here. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the Comedy Cave. The Comedy Cave, to this day, is the most electric club I've ever been in my life. It sat like 400 people, and it was just a crazy club. And the owners, uh, they let me stay in his basement, and then it all went downhill, but still. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great, great time. Well, how did it go downhill? Oh, tough questions. All right, so... There was a lot of drugs, and there was a certain biker gang that got involved, and all at the time there was this horrible, horrible accident with uh, a young lady that was in a tanning salon. She got abducted and ended up, you know, dead, and and so it was this benefit, uh, and Robin Williams was allegedly supposed to come, and and and. He just wasn't talked to at all. It was just a ruse by the, the club owner. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to leave to Los Angeles, and I was going to go. And then I met uh, this girl that I thought, that same voice in my head that, that told me I was supposed to do something important, I was supposed to be doing comedy, said, this is the next great person you're going to love in your life. And I walked into this little terrible restaurant in Burnaby called Fiestas, and I saw her, and I thought, okay. And so then I went home, and I ripped the ticket up, and then I called the club owner. I said, uh, if you can get this girl in to the club, I will stay and do the show because I know Robin Williams isn't coming. Hmm. And, uh, and he didn't come. And then... It, did the girl get into the show? Yeah, she got in. Got into my heart. Left some battle scars, but hmm. it's okay. You've got a few scars. You talk about your scars. Yeah. Some well, bad times. Good times. Did you have any time. trouble with drugs? I've never done drugs. Really? No. No. What no. about alcohol? Oh, good drinker. <laughs> good drinker. Good While drinker. you're performing? Sometimes, sometimes. I didn't learn that until I got to Canada. Oh. I was doing those those small towns, and that's their way of showing appreciation is throw you a bunch of tequila shots, and <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's We're crazy. very basic people. Oh, I know. <laughs> not big believers in the organ donor program. But <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> well. um, tell me the story. I, I've seen you do it in your routine, mm -hmm. but the story, um, one of the things you like about Canada is as a black man, you were coming out of a nightclub one night, mm -hmm. and the, the police were all out there. Yeah. Tell that story, will you? So I was uh, coming out of this nightclub, and I was walking, and, and all of a sudden, RCMP just swerved in the cars, one, two, three of them, and they just jump out, and they were running. They freeze, and they had their guns drawn, which you rarely see the RCMP pull the guns. Freeze! And so I just thought they meant me. It was just so, you know, an American thing. So I assumed the position. I give a hand on my head and my knees and everything. And they just run right by me. And there's a white guy right there. And they took the sticks of this guy and they're thumping him. And I was like, this is the best country I've ever been in my life. <laughs> and so they had him all hemmed up. And so I walked by and I said that. This is the best country I've ever seen in my life. I thought you guys were coming to me. And they had to start laughing. Even the guy that got beat up was laughing. <laughs> so then I knew I had a good joke on my hands.